Hello, everyone, and welcome back to our world-famous audio podcast of Coffee with Sister Vasa. I'm Sister Vasa, and Pentecost is coming up for those of us on the older calendar. I'm here today in Vienna, Austria, in our studio. Rob is not here with me today. I know. All of you will be disappointed. However, I do have an exciting topic for you. Don't worry, Rob will be back, by the way. <clears throat> He'll be back for our ne next podcast. He just had something else to do today, and I had to let him go. So, Pentecost is coming up finally, yes? And we will be once again, and for the first time after a while, singing to the Holy Spirit. O oh, Heavenly King. Yes, we have been abstaining from this most commonly heard prayer almost at every service that we hear to the Holy Spirit. We abstain from this prayer in a sort of liturgical game. It's like a playful side of liturgy where we abstain from mentioning the Holy Spirit in this particular prayer. And there's another instance of this as well in a hymn that is sung at the end of Divine Liturgy. Now, what do I mean by a playfulness of liturgy? Well, it's not like the Holy Spirit goes away anywhere for the 50 days between Pascha and Pentecost, but we exercise ourselves in this kind of liturgical abstinence in order to more to to experience more how could i say this <clears throat> more cogently the thirst for the holy spirit by not praying to him in that wonderful prayer during the 50 days so i think that this is something we should take note of that the church in our very rich tradition utilizes our human the humans the human capacity for a sort of playfulness in order to bring alive for us certain truths and feasts uh, and to prepare us for them in this way Okay, I don't know if anybody understood what I, what I meant by that, but I think that some of you probably did. Now, what I must mention is that it's been a difficult couple of days, in case you haven't heard. The Holy and Great Council that is about to convene in Crete has experienced some difficulty because of some churches pulling out at the last minute, including my church, the Russian Orthodox Church. Okay, so... I have to tell you, my beloved Zillions, that this was quite heartbreaking for me, and I think for many of us, yes, many of us, I think, might be disappointed. So I'd like to talk about Pentecost and refresh for myself, and perhaps for you as well, our hope and our desire for unity Uh, even when we are not doing so well in fulfilling our Lord's commandment to be one. So I'll just share with you at first some viewer mail. Yes, a viewer mail asked me about this. This was not the only message about uh, the recent developments, yes. But a woman on Facebook, I'll just read her message amongst many. This was a private message. Dear sister, she writes, I am heartbroken to hear that the Russian church isn't going to the council. Do you know what happened? Would love to hear your take on this development. Okay, it was a brief message, end of quote. So before we get into some of the details, I want to remind you that the purpose of this podcast is not to discourage us, but to reflect a bit on the meaning of Pentecost amidst events that may seem to discourage us from the very message of church unity that is given us through the event and through the continuous uh, consequences of that event of Pentecost. Okay, so while I will recognize and 
I do realize that it's disorienting what has been happening, and I'll get to exactly what is happening, the four churches that have pulled out of participation in the Holy and Great Council. While it's disorienting my beloved friends out there, I think there is a very positive side in that very fact. And I was thinking about this for two days already. What I'm, you know, how how can I process this in a prayerful manner? The word, the very word disorienting means that one loses the capacity to face east. Orienting oneself originally means facing east, like when a church building faces east. Now, when something is disorienting, we are thrown off from our focus. Who is called the Orient from on high or from above? Christ himself. He is the light from the east. Now, when I am disoriented, I need to get back to that focus on Christ. And I think that as church, at least for myself, because, you know, the only person I can change, really, and that I am really charged with changing and called to change every day by repentance, by refocusing, is myself. So let me orient myself to Christ. Let me focus on him and let me hope and pray and put my two cents in, in my own little prayers, to this, dedicate myself to this reorientation on Christ. Perhaps as church, it is time that we, beginning with ourselves, each and every one of us, reorient ourselves on the source of our unity, and that is the triune God because his spirit fills all things and his Holy Spirit is sent to us in our history at that historic event event of Pentecost, which continuously and abundantly is poured out onto the church despite our shortcomings throughout history. Okay, so let's take a disorienting fact of disunity in our church today, and take that as a tap on the shoulder from God to reorient ourselves towards him. Does that make sense to you, Zillions? Let's make that make sense for us, okay? Because that's what I'm telling myself today, all right? That's the positive side of this. And before we go on, because I will get into a bit of detail, not too much, I'm sure those of you who follow these things have had an earful of church politics, okay? So let's try to refresh our memory about what's about to happen on the Feast of Pentecost, all right? What is? What are some of the hopeful, many hopeful messages and God's, cre- yes, uncreated energies that come through to us through his words, his actions on that historical event that has not lost its, its power, and meaning, and salvific, salvific uh, energy in our lives. All right, here's the Traparian of the feast before I go on. The Traparian, which is the main hymn of the Byzantine Feast of Pentecost. Blessed are you, O Christ our God. You have revealed the fishermen as most wise by sending down upon them the Holy Spirit, Through them you drew the world into your net. O lover of man, glory to you. Yes, he drew the world into his net. And we don't mean the internet. (laughs) Okay? He, He drew the world into his net of his truth that hopefully draws us in so that we begin to prefer his light, his word to every other word, okay? His power to every other power, his authority, his kingdom to all other kingdoms. We want to be entangled in that net, that loving embrace of our Lord. Now, let's get to the Kantakion. That's sort of the the second in importance 
hymn of the feast? Well, it's lesser known. I wouldn't say it's less important. Anyway, the Kantakion usually reveals even a deeper spiritual side of a feast. The Tarparian often tells you the historical event, and then <clears throat> the Kantakian, it's not always true, but the Kantakian in the ancient feasts it gives us a, a deeper level of meaning. Anyway, <clears throat> in the Traparian that I just read to you, let's note the hopeful truth that fishermen were revealed as most wise, okay? Not the smartest guys on the block, necessarily, okay? So maybe despite some of the human shortcomings of some of our, some of the fishermen today, you know, that are leaders in our church. I'm not saying, ugh, look, I'm not, I'm not trying to criticize or point fingers here at anyone. Um, you will know the details from the news of what is happening. I don't think the point is, I don't think that we're called in these vicissitudes of our church life to think of anything but our own betterment. And I'm not just saying that because I'm trying to be diplomatic here. I'm very discouraged about these events. However, um, I feel better uh, after contemplating certain truths of the upcoming feast and some prayerful reflection. Yes, I can say that honestly to you that I feel a little bit better about these things right now. All right. Listen, Zillions, uh, I'm sorry Rob isn't here because you have to listen to my voice the whole time, but try not to uh, fall asleep here. We're going to talk about some interesting and inspiring things. Here I go. I'm reading the Kantakion as many of us prepare for this great feast coming up this weekend. <clears throat> Here's the Kantakion, the other hymn of the feast. When the Most High came down and confused the tongues, he divided the nations. All right, everybody knows what's being talked about here. When the Tower of Babel was being built, I'm not even sure how to say that in English. I'm sorry, Zillions, if I said that wrong. In the Old Testament, when the, um, I don't know what it's called. All right, so listen. When the Most High came down and confused the tongues, he divided the nations. But when he distributed the tongues of fire, he called all to unity. Therefore, <clears throat> with one voice, <clears throat> I don't seem to have a voice right now. Therefore, with one voice, we glorify the all-holy spirit. All right, that was the Kantakion. So he called all to unity when he distributed the tongues of fire on the apostles and all who were with them, the women and the men on Pentecost. So he called all to unity. Hmm. Are all responding to the call to unity? Well, no, not perfectly, not all the time. Okay, that's the, that's the truth of our human historical reality. However, that doesn't change that he does have tongues of fire on offer. He does have fire on offer for anyone opening his or her heart to him. That call is continuing to go out to all of us because as ecclesia, as church, we are the called ones. I've told you zillions before, and I think everybody probably knows that. The word church comes from ekaleo, to call forth or to call out. All right. So everyone who is part of church is called out, called forth. So every day I'm called out and I can respond if I want to. All right. Now listen, <clears throat> what has happened recently? Again, let's not look at this in a discouraging or dark light. Okay. Even though it's discouraging and it's, you know, these are not happy events. However, the call remains and the Holy Spirit does not leave his church. What happened, in case you people don't know, is that on June 13th, literally five days before the council was to begin, and it is beginning on June 18th, my church, the Russian church, pulled out, said it's not coming because, it said, for various reasons, um, but the first reason mentioned was because some other churches have pulled out and that it wouldn't be a pan-Orthodox council because of that. Now, the church is not going 
are the Bulgarian Church, the Antiochian Church, the Georgian Church, and now the fourth one is the Russian Church. Okay, so the Bulgarians and the Georgians had their reasons, the Antiochian Church, mainly because of its problems with uh, certain jurisdictional problems in Qatar uh, that involved the Jerusalem Patriarchate. It's, and uh, excuse me, I'm going to move on. But there are, listen up everybody, 10 autocephalous Orthodox churches. Not each church because the OCA isn't going. Let's not get upset about this, but... Well, that's upsetting too, but that is an autocephalous church. Now, but 10 of the autocephalous Orthodox churches are participating. The Ecumenical Patriarchate, the Patriarchate of Alexandria and Jerusalem, the churches of Cyprus, Greece, Serbia, Romania, Poland, of the Czech Republic, and Albania. All right, so 10 Autocephalous Orthodox churches are participating in the council, and the ones who are not participating, four churches, and yes, the Russian church is the largest one. That's what, uh, that's what is always repeated here, and that's why it's particularly upsetting, well, to me, because I happen to be a member of the Russian church. Anyway, there are two strange suppositions I want to call your attention to this, my friends. Two strange suppositions that are being mentioned uh, in justification of this decision not to go. The first strange supposition is that everyone must be attending for the council to be a council. Now, is that true in church history, that everybody participated in all of the great councils? Well, no, that's not true. For various reasons, usually political ones, or just problems in transportation and national boundaries, governmental boundaries, and certain conquests of nations by, you know, foreign conquests and stuff like that. But for various reasons, sometimes also because of reasons of church divisions. Um, Let's note the not everybody participated. In fact, um, only a minority participated in some of the greatest councils. Look at the... Th I, I just want to name a council that everybody recognizes as ecumenical. The Third Ecumenical Council of 431. Now, if you know your history of the councils, St. Cyril of Jerusalem... I'm not saying this is wrong. It has been received by the Church as an ecumenical council, but the council in Ephesus did not wait for all of the bishops of the East to arrive. John of Antioch arrived on the 26th of June in 431, but St. Cyril had already begun the council without John and all of his Eastern bishops. John was presumed to be a, a supporter, and yes, of Nestorius. Now, St. Cyril already began the council on June 22nd, and so everything was decided without the bishops who were opposing Cyril uh, at this council. So, was that politically correct according to our understanding? Nope. Was the council received? Now, that's a different case uh, than we have today. However, I'm simply saying that it's simply not true that everyone must be attending for a council to be a council. What is necessary for a council to be a council is for it to speak Orthodox faith, okay? And whether or not it does is to be discerned by the church, usually a lot later than the time of the council. Think about the first ecumenical council. It took practically the entire fourth century for that council to finally, finally to be received, okay? Now, the second strange supposition that is being voiced as justification of not going is that if we don't agree with every sentence of the draft documents, it's pointless to go. Okay, as if it's pointless to go if we don't like the draft documents they're just drafts, okay? It has been said time and again, and up to this day, that 
it's that's the whole point of the council. Yes, it's possible to revise. Yes, it's necessary to discuss. And the documents can be totally revised. Okay? The point is getting together so that this discussion can occur. And let's remind ourselves. Now, I'm not saying that this can be changed. I mean, maybe last minute somebody will change their minds and show up. I, I don't really see that happening. But, um... You know, my friends, the process of conciliarity is very important here, the actual getting together, because we don't only believe that the church is one and holy and apostolic, we believe that the church is Catholic. We don't hear much opposition about the use of this word or any interest in it. What does it mean? Ismian, Aegean, Catholicin, Ke Apostolicin, Ecclesiam, in one holy Catholic and Apostolic Church. The word Catholic, it, it talks about this level, this conciliar level that goes beyond and above the local level of our local opinions and the specificity of our own particular church, okay? Catholic comes from kasolu, that literally means, it's a little bit hard to explain, but it literally means according to or in respect of the whole. And it's usually translated as universal. But there are there is a wealth of meaning to this word, which means all embracing in the sense of the fullness, embracing the fullness of the truth, but also including all members of the body of Christ, wherever, whenever they happen to be. Not just one nation or people of one geographical location or state or political ideas, okay? When we profess our faith in the Catholicity, is that a word, of the church, we profess a faith in a level of church unity that is beyond, okay, beyond our local cultures. And this is very difficult, okay? It's difficult. I think we have to understand and have compassion for this cross of disunity that we bear, okay? But our unity is realized in conciliarity. There is no other way for us to realize this Unity, at least in periodically getting together for councils. That is the way it's been since the church even had the possibility of having councils. And there is there is a whole series of church canons that were promulgated practically at each of the great councils from the first to the seventh that insist on regular councils not only for a local church, but if you look at Canon 30 of the Holy Apostles, well, on a, on a level beyond the local church. You could look, at, look it up yourselves. I'm not going to bore you with quotes from the canons, okay? My friends, now, even, you know, the, this, this meaning of Catholicity being involved with and yes, connected to conciliarity, is reflected in the Slavonic translation of the word Catholic, as many of you will know, is sabornaya. And that literally means conciliar, that we believe in the Catholic Church, we say sabornaya tserkev. So it's a conciliar church. Anyway, if we do believe in the Church being Catholic, all embracing, including all members of the body of Christ and embracing the fullness of the truth, well, we have to consider this important and not just say, well, we can, you know, we can stay apart and hold on to our hats as we like. And, you know, I was about to say something, not entirely uh, comme il faut, so I won't say it, but I was going to say something to the effect of who cares about everybody else. 
But let me get back to some positive thoughts here. Let's take heart. Let's take heart, okay? There's nothing new about the shortcomings of church unity, okay? Let's remember something I've been perhaps over-quoting. You have heard it on many podcasts already, my beloved zillions. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 19, 1 Corinthians 11, 19, the Apostle Paul tells us, each and every one of us, for there must be also differences among you, that they which are approved or tested, dokimi, may be made manifest among you. So he says there must be differences among you, divisions, heresies, is the word used in Greek, that they which are approved or, or tested, reliable, may be made manifest among you. So this is what I want to say. Let's be Let's prove to be faithful and true to our Lord and the unity he called us to, okay? By keeping faith and not being discouraged by this stuff going on. All right. So let's also reflect on another passage. We will get to the passage in Acts 2 about Pentecost, okay? Because I would like to stop and prepare for the feast in a way that is spirit-filled and staying close to scripture uh, in order to, yes, to counter some of the, the negative effects of this news, the church news that is coming through and that is inevitable, I think, if you don't live in a cave. So here we go. What is our Lord we're going on to a different scripture passage, okay, everybody? In John 3, the famous conversation that our Lord has with Nicodemus. See, Nicodemus, as one of the teachers of Israel, as Christ calls him, is on a different page. He doesn't quite understand what our Lord says to him about the Spirit and the workings of the Holy Spirit. So, Christ says to Nicodemus in John 3, verse 7, Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born anew. All right, I'm interrupting the quote. Christ has just told Nicodemus that one must be born anew, and Nicodemus doesn't understand what this means. Now our Lord goes on to say in verse 8, The Spirit blows where he will, and you hear his sound, but you do not know whence he comes or whither he goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Why am I reading this to you, my friends? I I interrupted the quote again. Because I would like to be assured today, and remember this word of our Lord, that the Spirit blows where he will, and we cannot control him. There is this divine human reality that is the Church, but the Spirit remains free. There is no Church without the Holy Spirit. And so the actions and words of men cannot control the spirit-filled church, despite what it looks like, despite appearances. Okay, so Nicodemus says to our Lord after this, how can this be? See, Nicodemus is this traditional teacher of Israel. He doesn't get what this means. How can this be? And Jesus answered him, I'm quoting again, Are you a teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand this? I can almost hear him saying this to some of our teachers today. Are you a teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand this? Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know and bear witness to what we have seen, but you do not receive our testimony. Isn't this amazing, my friends? I'm interrupting the quote, obviously, again. Our Lord is speaking in the we. Who is he talking about? He's already talking from the church. He's already saying we. Just like he says, our Father, amazingly praying as one of us. So he says, truly, truly, I say to you, we speak, says Jesus Christ, of what we know and bear witness to what we have seen. But you do not receive our testimony. 
If I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you heavenly things? All right, end of quote. So, amazingly, our Lord is speaking very directly about a spirit-filled life, and he's telling Nicodemus who the boss is. He's saying, who's the boss in our rebirth? And that is the Holy Spirit. Okay, so I'm going to hold on to this truth that our Lord assures us of, because this has been written down for us not to forget. All right. Okay, now let's move on. I know this is a quote heavy podcast, my friends. Rob is not here to control this and to say, sister, slow down with the quotes. Okay, so if the quotes are out of control, my friends, sorry about that. I think I need a dose of scripture today. Okay, I've had a dose of lots of human words about these events that have transpired in connection with the Holy and Great Council. So let's, let's uh, contemplate the event of Pentecost that is <clears throat> passed on to us and remembered in the second chapter of the book of Acts. All right? We're reading together what happened on Pentecost and what continues to have wonderful consequences for us in our every day of church existence. Okay, here we go. I'm reading from the very first verse of the second chapter of Acts. If you didn't know that Pentecost and the event of the descent of the Holy Spirit is in the second chapter of the book of Acts, well, now you know. <laughs> You're welcome. Here we go, everybody. Let's read this together. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. And suddenly a sound came from heaven, like the rush of a mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared to them tongues as of fire, distributed and resting on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and began to speak in other tongues, as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven, and at this sound the multitude came together, and they were bewildered, because each one heard them speaking in his own language, and they were amazed and wondered, saying, Are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in his own native language? Okay, I'm interrupting the quote. I'm going to skip down. So, you know... This story, I think, my beloved Zillions, the, all of these visitors to the holy city are wondering about this event, and they hear the apostles speaking in their own tongue. Now, what I'd like to contemplate is some verses further down. When St. Peter begins preaching after this event, and he begins right away by talking about the crucifixion and death uh, and resurrection of our Lord. This was always the message of the apostles, the central message about the resurrection. And he completes this part of his speech in verse 36. I'm going down a little bit in the chapter. This is how St. Peter complete, concludes this part of his speech. And then I want to talk about what the people ask of the apostles. They say, what shall we do? All right, but let's, okay, let's continue how St. Peter completes his, the first part of his address to the people. Let all the house of Israel, he says, therefore know assuredly that God has made him, that, that is Jesus, both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. All right, now when they, okay, sorry, I put in the all right, obviously. Now when they heard, I'm continuing the quote. When they heard this, they were cut to the heart. It says they were pierced in the heart. And said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brethren, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you shall receive 
the gift of the Holy Spirit. Okay, I'm interrupting the quote. Now, this is what happens to us, my friends. We are cut to the heart or pierced in the heart from that initial hearing about Christ, that meeting with him that happens through that that kerigma, that, that, that preaching about him, the good news, okay? And when we are thus moved, pierced in the heart, we get this question, what do I do now? What should I do? That's a wonderful question when you're left with, I don't know what I've been doing until now. I need help to know what to do. I need guidance. This is where, this is the kind of waking up to the fullness of the body of Christ through, through a meeting with him, essentially. Okay, so let's retrieve today this kind of call that these people felt from hearing spirit-filled word, spirit-filled preaching about our Lord. Let's ask, what shall we do? And let's ask in the right place, okay? Peter said to them, repent and be baptized, every one of you. Okay, so most of you people out there listening to this podcast, not everyone, I know that not everyone who listens is baptized, but the first word Peter says is repent, which means change your focus, change your mind, okay? And be baptized, baptism, yes? Do we remember our baptism? Many of us don't if we were baptized as babies. Some of us remember, those of you out there who were baptized as adults, <clears throat> yes, we are, we are crucified, buried, and resurrected in Christ. Even if it happened when, if we were baptized as infants, this indeed happened, right? So let's remember that we were not and are not imitators of Christ's death and resurrection. We are participants in it. We participate in his cross-carrying, in his death, being dead to sin. Yes, we do sin again daily, but we are constantly called to repent. That's the ongoing mission, inner mission of the church. We are works in progress. We receive a spark in baptism, and we continue to foster that spark and to, to grow it into a flame. So Peter says further to them, when he says, Be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now listen up, everybody. Maybe you've already clicked me off today, my friends. If you're still with me, listen up. You shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is to you, he says, and to your children, and to all that are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to him. Okay, end of quote. So what are we hearing here? The promise is to all of us and to all that are far off like me, and like maybe some of you out there, I don't know, I'm often far off, you know, I, I get way off. And everyone is called by our Lord, called to him. We are always called to come back every day, okay? So let's hear that wonderful call that never stops. Because Peter says further to them, testifying, as it says in the book of Acts, with many other words and exhorting them. He says further, save yourselves from this crooked generation. So who is he talking about there? I don't know exactly. There were probably lots of crooks, just like there are today. <laughs> there are crooked moments, you know, in our hearts that need to be straightened out constantly, making straight the paths of the Lord as St. John the Baptist calls people to do. So um, 
Those who received Peter's word were baptized, and there were added that day about 3,000 souls. And they devoted themselves, it finally says here in this wonderful second chapter of the book of Acts, and they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. Okay, so I think that's my program set out for me as a result of Pentecost, devoting ourselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship. It's kinonia, the communion within community, to the breaking of bread. Yes, there's the Eucharist and the prayers. So let's not stumble or be discouraged by historical events. Yes, because that is the cross of history that we continue to bear. Okay, let's, let's be encouraged and fortified by the word of God and by this great feast coming up. Perhaps it's not as we expected things to turn out. Maybe we expected there to be this big triumph and cloudless sky, you know, for Pentecost. However, the Holy Spirit cannot be obscured by our shortcomings. He is coming. He does descend upon his church, continuously fortifying the church, making possible her life in the sacraments, and making possible true life. That's what makes the whole difference between a church and, you know, some kind of a friendly society of, of good behavior. All right, everybody, so that's it for today's podcast. And uh, in conclusion, I'll just read the Kantakion of the Feast of Pentecost one more time. I love this Kantakion. I'm going to read this Kantakion. When the Most High came down and confused the tongues, he divided the nations. But when he distributed the tongues of fire, he called all to unity. Therefore, with one voice, we glorify the All-Holy Spirit. All right, everybody, so those of you not celebrating Pentecost, well, happy ongoing existence and being in Christ, okay, and in his Holy Spirit, according to the will of his Father. And to those of us celebrating Pentecost this upcoming weekend, happy Pentecost. And thank you for tuning in, my friends. Don't miss our video. It's an old one, but it's a good one, I think. Um... Did I say it was a good video? I know. Uh, in all humility. <laughs> I'm just going to recommend that you watch the video on Pentecost. All right? Coffee with Sister Vaso, the YouTube video. Don't miss it. Okay? And next week we have a new Divine Liturgy video coming up for you. We have covered the little entrance. We're moving on to the Traparia of the day. So don't miss that. And please catch up on those videos if you haven't caught up on them yet. What else is there to tell you? I don't know. Well, have I told you already that I'll be in North Carolina in Wilmington at the end of July? Check out my speaking schedule. I'll also be speaking in Boston. I'm going to meet some Coptic friends <clears throat> that have written to me recently. Annie and her mom who wrote to me. You know who you are, <laughs> my Coptic friends. All right, everybody. Anyway, I love all of you people very much. I ask your forgiveness for any insufficient support, perhaps. Uh, whatever. I think that we all carry responsibility for some of this disunity that's being demonstrated in connection with the council. Perhaps we haven't prayed enough. I know I haven't. So let's carry the responsibility together without blaming any particular person because, you know, we do carry responsibility just like we carry common blessings as church. So let's bear the cross of disunity together, okay? Let's not further divide and be divided by the blame game, okay? Is anybody still with me? Hello? <laughs> Maybe you are. Rob is going to listen to this and think that I've gone off the, off the deep end. I haven't. I'm fine. Okay, everybody? So, I love you. Happy upcoming Pentecost, or not. And, 
yes, tune in next time for our next podcast. And this has been Coffee with Sister Vasa, a habit you do support.